Good morning. Welcome to uh, Cardiology Grand Rounds. Uh, as we traditionally do, we introduce a, uh, a new uh, st study to everyone uh, because we could always use your uh, help in recruitment. Uh, this is the Freedom Study. Um, this is for uh, patients who have uh, chronic uh, chest pain but have no significant coronary disease. This is kind of a subset of patients that we refer to as having like microvascular angina. They're uh, thought to have impaired endothelial function, and as a manifestation of that, they, they have to have reduced coronary flow reserve uh, in, in their coronary system. Uh, this is obviously can be measured invasively in the cath lab in response to adenosine, but we can now also measure this non-invasively using nuclear, during a nuclear myoview PET study. So uh, they've been routinely reporting these answers sometimes. So this is a nice way that could act as a screening tool. Uh, this, this study involves the use of CD34 stem cells, which is thought to be an endothelial progenitor cell. And we've had a lot of experience with these uh, cells uh, over the last decade in patients with refractory angina and coronary disease, where these cells were actually shown for the first time to improve exercise capacity, reduce angina, and actually improve mortality when all the three uh, studies were uh, combined. Um, and this is sort of an offshoot of that, using this for a new application. So this is particularly germane for women uh, because it seems like, you know, most of the patients with this are women. So uh, hopefully the uh, women's program will be able to get uh, uh, involved in, uh, in this study. And we enrolled our first patient uh, last uh, week. So if you have any uh, questions about this study, they get uh, GCSF, sub-Q injections over five days, which raises your circulating CD34 cells, and they undergo an apheresis procedure, and the cells are collected and then processed and returned uh, two days later to undergo intracoronary infusion in the uh, cath lab. So if you have any questions, we're happy to answer. Jane Fox is, uh, is uh, helping us out uh, on this uh, study, and we're always available uh, uh, for questions. So thanks a lot. See that uh, Ravi is getting ready. Do you hear me? Yes, Dr. Dasher. Good. So, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gudetti now. Uh, as you all know by now, uh, this year was the first year that we had two uh, interventional fellows, and I have to say that uh, we couldn't be luckier than having um, uh, Yash and Ravi in our program this year and being the inaugural. Uh, fellows for this. So uh, Ravi uh, joined us from a internal medicine residency from Marshfield Clinic, Wisconsin, um, had then his cardiology fellowship in Creighton University, had also some uh, research experience with Dr. Gibson and uh, Dr. Lerman, that we all know uh, at Mayo Clinic. Um, Ravi also is lucky enough to have a job uh, like everybody else here in our fellowship. It's always good news. And he's going to do a J1 waiver at the Cape Fear Valley Medical Center in North Carolina. Long term, he would like to be, though, in a more academic setting. Um, clinical research uh, interests for his as, um, complex coronary disease has done some here with uh, Manos circulatory support, as you will see in the talk, and also, if possible, later on, valvular heart disease. So his talk today is mechanical circulatory support in the cath lab, and where are we now? And yeah, I'm happy to introduce Ravi and enjoy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gussel, for your kind words. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, my topic for today is mechanical circulatory support in the cath lab and where we are as of now in terms of evidence. I chose this topic because of my personal interest in shock and hemodynamics, and also there is so much dilemma and uh, uh, controversies in terms of use of support devices in shock. So my objectives for today are to understand the indications for mechanical circulatory support and to review the evidence behind it, and to identify patient selection criteria and who, who needs to get a support device and how do we identify them. Uh, obviously, Mechanical circulatory support is a huge topic, but for the sake of discussion today, I'll be exclusively discussing about cardionic shock and MI, and also high-risk PCI settings. Starting off with mechanical circulatory support in cardionic shock secondary to acute MI. Uh, briefly about cardionic shock, uh, it's a state of critical end-organ hypoperfusion secondary to 
LV dysfunction and is characterized by hypertension, uh, signs of impaired organ dysfunction, um, and a reduced cardiac index, along with elevated filling pressures. And it com cardiogenic shock complicates about 5 to 10 percent of acute MI cases. And you can see in the uh, uh, figure here what are the common causes of shock in acute MI. Uh, most of that is from LV failure, followed by uh, MR, RV failure, VSD, and very rarely cardiac tamponade. And pressure volume loop curves. In acute MI, uh, due to re reduction in LV, uh, due to LV injury, there is a reduced LV uh, systolic uh, function, contractility. That causes a uh, decrease in uh, stroke volume. You can see by the Emax, which is a, a parameter for LV contractility, which is reduced. And in cardiogenic shock, the curve shifts all the way to the right, where you see elevated uh, end systolic and end diastolic volumes very severely reduced LV contractility and stroke volume, and also elevated uh, afterload. So these are the five stages of cardiogenic shock as per Sky. They were named uh, A, B, C, D, E as at risk, beginning, classic, deteriorating, and extremis. And uh, cardiac mortality actually increases significantly as we go up the pyramid. And uh, briefly about uh, pathophysiology of shock. It all starts with myocardial injury causing the, uh, reduction in cardiac output and stroke volume, which eventually leads to hypotension and uh, systemic per, uh, hypoperfusion, which sets off the whole cascade of systemic inflammation, inflammatory cytokines, and we, that goes into a vicious cycle, leading to end organ dysfunction and eventually death. And as of now, these are the options we have for mechanical circulatory support, uh, primarily for shock in MI, balloon pump, impella, tandem heart, and ECMO. And what's an ideal mechanical circulatory support device? The one that maintains vital organ perfusion, thereby preventing systemic shock syndrome. One that reduces intravascular filling pressures, thereby reducing congestion and pulmonary edema. The one that reduces LV volumes, thereby stress and oxygen consumption. And finally, the one that augments perfusion as well, coronary perfusion. Starting off with the intraortic balloon pump, uh, start off with a case here. Uh, this one was uh, from three weeks ago, 90-year-old, <coughs> 90-year-old male comes in with chest pain to the ER. EKG showed acute inferior MI uh, complicated by complete heart block and a junctional escape rhythm of 43 beats per minute. When he came to the cath lab, initially his systolic blood pressure was in hundreds. And soon thereafter, he deteriorates uh, and goes into refib arrest, requiring multiple shocks, imidrone, and pressors. So this was our first angiogram. The left system had non-obstructive disease, and the right is completely occluded. At this point, he was continuing to have refib, shock, uh, refib, refib arrest, and we had to shock him multiple times. So we intubated him first, put in a balloon pump, you can see here with the arrow, and then did a PCI of RCA with a good T3 flow. Uh, in, in his case, uh, we left the balloon pump for 48 hours, and eventually he got uh, extubated in four days and uh, uh, was discharged to a nursing home uh, about, after about a week. So balloon pump, this is the most basic of all mechanical circulatory support devices and has been used in, uh, uh, for almost six decades now. So the mechanism is uh, uh, diastolic inflation of a uh, uh, helium-filled balloon in the descending iota. That causes diastolic augmentation, which in turn increases coronary perfusion, reduces after load, thereby reducing uh, myocardial oxygen demand and increasing supply. And you can see by the pressure volume loop curve here, the stroke volume SV1 increases to SV2, and uh, the afterload, which is a parameter for uh, EA, EA, which reduces to, uh, the slope reduces to EA2. But there is no, not much change in contractility because the patient is still dependent on their own native LV contractile function. So the IOBP shock true trial, before this trial came out, there were several observation study, studies and meta-analysis that showed some conflicting evidence for use of balloon pump in shock and MI. And this was the first large-scale uh, randomized trial that included 600 patients, 300 in balloon pump, and uh, 299 in no balloon pump. And 30-day all-cause mortality was the primary outcome. Uh, surprisingly, none of the uh, endpoints were significant or, or in favor of a balloon pump. And you can see by the kaplan meier curve here, the uh, mortality rate was similar in both the control group and the balloon pump group. Uh, in 2019, the same group published six-year outcomes uh, of balloon pump for, for the shock two, uh, for the IABP shock two trial, and again, all-cause mortality was no different. So was uh, recurrent MI and repeat revascularization. But there are a few important points to remember for this trial. There was a significant crossover rate of 14.2 percent, 
10% to the IABP group and 4.2% to the non-balloon pump group. And this was a relatively underpowered trial. The reason I say that is when they first calculated the sample size, it was based on an estimated or assumed uh, mortality rate of 56%. However, when they looked at the whole trial, it was uh, the mortality rate was 40%. So they had to recalculate uh, the sample size based on a 40% mortality rate. Uh, the number should have been more than 900. And some people argued that uh, the mortality rate was just 40%. Maybe the patients enrolled in the study were relatively low risk compared to what they assumed initially. And lastly and most importantly, uh, timing of the balloon pump insertion. It was at the discretion of the operator, and 83% of them got after they got the PCI. That brings us to the next question, which is, what if we place a balloon pump before PCI compared to an after in patients with shock and MI? And this was one small study that looked at this. Actually, this was published two years before the IABP shock 2 trial. 26 patients uh, got balloon pump before PCI, and 22 got after PCI. And the ones that got a balloon pump before PCA had a significantly lower uh, CKMB in hospital mortality and CVA. In conclusion, uh, so balloon pump is still the most commonly used device because it's uh, easily available, low cost, and easy to insert. Uh, just we need a nine French uh, access uh, in the femoral artery. Uh, and, but it only improves the cardiac output modestly. Again, as I said, the patients are still dependent on their native LV function to improve their cardiac output. Uh, it does reduce uh, LV afterload and increase uh, coronary blood flow uh, during diastole, and, uh, but the clinical outcomes are unfavorable as of now for routine use. That's why the European uh, guidelines uh, downgraded the indication to class three for routine use. But, if, uh, but our American guidelines in from 2013 still uh, suggest uh, using balloon pump if uh, medical therapy is not working. Coming to Impella, which is the most sought after mechanical circulatory support device in the cat lab uh, currently. Uh, so there are three different uh, uh, versions of Impella, 2.5, CP, and 5. There are also some newer versions uh, for like Impella RP, Impella ECP, which is an expandable CP, uh, and Impella 5.5. So the basic uh, mechanism of this device is it's an axial flow device. So it takes out blood from the LV and puts it into the iota. So in that process, it's unloading the LV, increasing forward flow, thereby decreasing LV size, pressure, and wall stress, and thereby oxygen demand as well, and also uh, decreasing pulmonary wedge pressures. If you see the curve here, uh, it shifts all the way to the left. Um, uh, again, there is a small flaw in this uh, picture here. It has to be like a triangular curve rather than a rectangular because there is no isovolumetric contraction or relaxation uh, when there is impella in place because it's a continuous axial flow device. And uh, this, is, uh, this graph shows the use of impella over the past uh, uh, six, eight years. Uh, once it's, uh, it was approved back in 2008, you can see how significantly uh, it went up. Uh, the Iser shock trial was one of the first trials uh, uh, of uh, cardiogenic shock and uh, MI patients where they used impella 2.5 12 patients uh, versus a balloon pump, 13 patients. Their outcome was increase in cardiac index at 30 minutes after uh, the device insertion. You can see here uh, it was significant. However, if you look at the rest of the uh, time, there was no significant difference between uh, balloon pump and impella. Again, although not powered for survival, uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, find any difference uh, between the two devices. This was followed by the IMPRESS trial, uh, where they randomized uh, 48 patients with shock and MI to Impella CP. This was a CP device compared to 2.5 in the previous trial, uh, versus a balloon pump, 24 patients again. And 30 day all cause mortality was the primary outcome. And again, as uh, surprisingly, 30 day all cause mortality and six month all cause mortality was no different between the two groups. And this graph shows uh, the survival. There are, again, there are a few points about this trial. Uh, it's an interesting study because the authors enrolled extremely sick patients in this study. All of them were ventilated. 92% of them had cardiac arrest before they, they got the impella and, uh, or, or a balloon pump. And largely, all of them were comatose patients. And their baseline lactate was really high at 8. So the reason they did was, this was uh, their initial plan was to enroll 130 patients in each arm. But they couldn't enroll, uh, and they had to stop the study prematurely. And uh, they, they enrolled sick patients to maximize their outcomes by taking less number of patients. That was their rationale for doing this 
And the other important thing is, again, 83% of them got a device after reverse calibration. And that brings us to the same question again. What should, should we place Impella before or after? So this U.S. Impella registry study uh, from 38 uh, sites in U.S. looked at that uh, particular question. Uh, uh, Pre-PCI versus post-PCI, 63 and 91. And survival to discharge was their primary outcome. And uh, uh, as you see here, uh, at 30 days, there was significantly better uh, survival in the Impella pre-PCI uh, group compared to Impella post-PCI group. And uh, in multivariable analysis, they identified that insertion of Impella prior to PCI was uh, uh, associated with better in-hospital mortality rates. And few other important studies worth mentioning here are the Detroit Cardiogenic Shock Initiative study uh, back in 2018 that uh, from four centers in Detroit. They had 41 patients with acute MI and CS, um, and they used Impella CP prior to uh, PCI. So they compared that, uh, that 41 patients with the historical controls uh, from the e previous year, and their uh, results were really staggering. 85% of the patients survived to explant versus 51 patients in historic controls. And they also saw that uh, post-procedure uh, cardiac power out, uh, output was significantly higher in the Impella uh, CP group compared to historic controls. And this was followed by a national cardiogenic shock initiative. This was just an extension of the Detroit uh, cardiogenic shock initiative study, where 35 centers participated in this uh, study, uh, 171 patients, again, Impella CP before uh, PCI. And survival to discharge was 72%. And the last study, the INOVA, which is a very interesting study, this highlights the importance of uh, using a shock team-based approach. A shock team, according to them, comprises of uh, um, advanced heart failure, intervention cardiology, uh, critical care, and um, uh, CT surgery. And they again compared their, uh, their 204 patients uh, to historic controls. Again, the 204 patients are not exclusively acute MI, short and shock. They also had advanced uh, uh, acute decompensated heart failure patients. And the survival at 30 days, in the first year they implemented the shock team-based approach was 57.9% compared to 47% the year before, which was significant. And then the next year, it was 76.6%. This, again, highlights the, uh, how important it is to have uh, a team-based approach for uh, management of shock and MI. And this is one other study, interesting study, that compared Impella to balloon pump. They, uh, they had 237 patients, and they matched them to the Impella, uh, to the balloon pump group taken from the IABP shock 2 trial. Um, uh, interestingly, they didn't find any difference in 30-day mortality, and there were more bleeding and vascular complications with Impella. And lastly, these two trials from uh, 2020 in circulation and JAMA, respectively, they, uh, these are database uh, studies uh, from uh, 48,000 patients from the Premier Healthcare database and 28,000 patients from chest pain, uh, uh, MI, and CAT PCI registries. Um, they had a decent number of patients in each, each study, and they identified that Impella was associated with more death bleeding, and stroke, uh, and that was consistent in the other study as well. And uh, in this study, again, they divided based on before initiation of PCI versus after initiation, and nothing, and uh, none of the results were favorable for uh, Impella. In conclusion, Impella is an axial flow device that improves uh, blood flow uh, uh, by actively unloading the LV and decreasing wall stress and oxygen demand. However, its use in cardiogenic shock and MI is currently limited based on lack of evidence. But having said that, timing of Impella may actually play a significant role if they could do a randomized trial uh, with enough numbers. Tandem heart. Um, I've not uh, seen any tandem heart performed in the past year I've been here, but this is an interesting device. It has a transeptal cannula situated in the LA and an arterial cannula in the femoral artery. So what it does essentially is takes out blood from the LA, by thereby reducing LV preload, and puts that in the iota. Um, so LV preload is decreased, uh, same, uh, thereby decreasing workload and filling pressures. But the blood pressure improves, cardiac output improves, so does LV afterload. You can see here, with increasing flow from 1.5 to 3 to 4.5, you can see how the curves change. Um, the stroke volume goes down significantly, LV afterload increases, uh, and uh, LV contractility decreases. So uh, Tandem Heart Investigation Investigators Group is a randomized trial that included 42 patients at 12 centers. 70% uh, of them uh, were acute MI, 
and uh, they studied tandem heart versus balloon pump, 21 and 21. And uh, their primary outcome was just change in hemodynamics, uh, how tandem heart changes hemodynamics compared to balloon pump. They noticed that um, tandem heart is associated with significant increase in cardiac index, uh, MAPS, and significant decrease in vector pressures. However, at 30 days, the survival was no different. This was followed by the European tandem heart trial, which is actually similar to uh, the previous trial. Uh, this one has 41 patients uh, with shock and MI. At balloon pump was 20, tandem heart 21. And their outcome was change in cardiac power index at two hours after device implantation. And uh, as expected, the cardiac output is better, uh, MAPs are better, uh, pulmonary uh, uh, artery pressure is actually down. However, they didn't, they didn't find any significant difference in mortality. So in conclusion, tandem heart is, uh, it improves uh, hemodynamics significantly for sure, but again, as of now, we don't have enough evidence to uh, routinely use uh, this device in shock and MI. And finally, uh, uh, ECMO. Uh, I'll start off with the case for ECMO. It's a 48-year-old male who came into the ER with chest pain. He's been having chest pain for two weeks. Interestingly, he had a negative stress echo just three days or four days prior to, uh, prior to presentation. And EKG was unremarkable except for sinus bradycardia. And soon after, he becomes unresponsive, goes into V-fib arrest, requiring several shocks, and started him on ACLS protocol, and a Lucas device was initiated. Uh, the, interestingly, they did a bedside TE quickly in the ER that showed incessant V-fib. So he was brought to the cath lab for uh, uh, ECMO initiation first. So we put in ECMO, and after that, we, shock, uh, we uh, shoot his uh, coronary arteries that showed thrombotic occlusion of his left anterior descending artery. So we immediately ballooned and put in a stent there uh, with a good TME3 flow at the end. But if you notice here, um, let me play this here. There is, the, the attic valve is not opening at all. Um, and uh, we decided, OK, let's, let's just go ahead and place an impella to vent the LV. So this was our uh, impella. And you can see the ECMO cannula there. So uh, unfortunately, I couldn't track this patient. He was, uh, because of lack of beds here, he was shipped to uh, U, U, of, uh, U of M, uh, University of Minnesota. And I talked to one of the impeller reps to, because he was following the same patient there. And he said he was still alive a few days ago. So I don't know uh, what's going on there. So the most common configuration of VA ECMO we use is uh, in shock uh, and MI is VA ECMO, obviously. Uh, and the use of ECMO has been rapidly evolving, especially in the past decade. And, uh, but the data is mostly retrospective observational anal data uh, and meta-analysis and can provide up to five to six liters of cardiac output. And the mechanism is simple. Uh, there is a venous cannula situated in the IVC. It takes blood from the RA and puts it in the oxygenator. And the oxygenated blood goes back into the femoral artery, into the iota. Again, RV and diastolic volume goes down because it's taking blood from the RA. Mean arterial pressure goes up, and LV afterload goes up. And you can see with the increase in flow from 1.5 to 3 and to 4.5, to how the curves change. Significant increase in uh, LV afterload. Um, this was one study back in 2010 that looked at 46 patients uh, uh, on ECMO, uh, and they compared to patients in the previous years uh, to see how they're doing. And then 30-day 30, 30 survival was actually significantly higher with ECMO at 72% compared to 39% in the years before ECMO initiation. And you can see the graph. The graph, uh, actually, effect you can see here, it's within the first few days, you can see that effect. This was a small meta-analysis of four studies uh, in patients with acute MI and shock. Uh, they compared ECMO to balloon pump, and they also compared ECMO to tandem heart or impeller. Uh, with, compared to balloon pump, obviously, there was a 33% higher survival uh, at 30 days, and, but there was no difference in survival when compared to tandem heart or impella. Um, this was, again, if you, look at, if you look at details of the meta-analysis, there were only two studies that compared ECMO to balloon pump, and there were two studies that compared ECMO to impella or tandem heart. When they pulled all the uh, four studies, they didn't find much difference. I could find only one randomized control trial uh, for ECMO in shock and MI. Uh, this was the one uh, that included 42 patients, 21 to ECMO and 21 to no device at all. And their outcome was actually pretty interesting. LVEF change at 30 days. 
Um, and um, th this was a randomized trial, but for some reason, it was not published as a full manuscript. They, it was just a research letter. So the, uh, we couldn't find too many, I couldn't find too many details about this trial. And at 30 days, there was no significant difference in LVEF between controls and uh, ECMO groups. And the survival was not different either. In conclusion, VA ECMO, it's been used increasingly, uh, especially in patients with, who present with cardiac arrest, secondary to MI, provides a maximal support of, compared to any other uh, support device uh, currently. But high quality evidence is still lacking. Before I move on to the next part of the ta talk, uh, briefly I want to discuss about a mechanical circulatory support device used in STEMI without shock. So the concept was if you unload the LV, you decrease LV and diastolic pressure, uh, wall stress, and oxygen demand uh, in an acutely infarcting uh, patient. Thereby, you activate cardioprotective signaling pathways. That was the whole concept that increases uh, cardiac microvascular perfusion to the infarct zone, thereby reducing infarct zone and also scar, scar tissue eventually. And all of this was proved uh, in animal studies, but none of the human studies were uh, that overwhelmingly positive. The CRISP-AMI trial was back in 2011 that looked at uh, anterior STEMI without shock, and they took a balloon pump as their uh, uh, device. And uh, infarct size at 30 day, uh, three to five days was the uh, uh, primary outcome. And if you notice here, it's a little surprising. Uh, in the balloon pump and PCI group, uh, the mean infarct size uh, was 42.1% uh, um, of LV mass compared to 37.5% in the PCI alone group, which is actually borderline significant for, uh, for PCI alone group. Um, uh, that tells us, should we even use a balloon pump in, a, in an acute MI patient without a shock? And again, but no difference in uh, event rates at uh, uh, 30 days, at six months. And this was a famous uh, door to unload STEMI trial uh, published back in 2019 in circulation. This was a multicentral feasibility trial that included 50 patients with anterior MI without shock. So their uh, protocol was you unload the LV using an impella CP, then perform immediate revascularization versus you unload the LV followed by a wait period of 30 minutes and then revascularize. That is a delayed revascularization group. Primary outcome was MACE and infarct size at 30 days. And obviously the impella to PCI time was significantly higher in the delayed group, which is because of the 30 minute wait time. But at 30 days, there was no difference in uh, MACE or even infarct size uh, compared to uh, in between the two groups, delayed versus uh, uh, in immediate revascularization group. Again, more data is, is to be uh, gathered for routine use of uh, circulatory support device in PCI and STEMI patients before PCI. So as I said, the guidelines, uh, the ESC 2017 STEMI guidelines say that in patients with refractory shock, you can use short-term mechanical uh, support, which is a class 2B indication. But routine use of balloon pump is uh, not recommended, which is a class 3. And uh, ACC uh, 2013 guidelines say that you can use balloon pump if medical therapy fails. If, they're not, if you're not able to stabilize the patient on uh, pressors and uh, uh, other therapies, you can use balloon pump, which is a class 2A. And uh, alternative assist devices can be used uh, in refractory shock, which is a class 2B, similar to European guidelines. So moving on to uh, the second part of the talk, mechanical circulatory support in high-risk PCI. So case, um, it's an 84-year-old uh, female who came in with uh, NSTEMI. She has a history of severe aortic stenosis as well. You can see the mean gradient of 58. And this was her initial uh, angiogram that showed severe calcified distal left main, proximal uh, circumflex, and osteal LAD uh, stenosis. Uh, CT surgery said she's not a good candidate given her age and frailty. And a patient was also not interested in surgical options. So our plan was to do a balloon valloplasty first to, uh, and then put an impella and then perform a high-risk PCI of the left main uh, that included atherectomy as well. So this was the final result after uh, PCI of left main. And eventually, a few days later, she got her tower valve. So what is a high-risk PCI? I mean, there is no uh, formal uh, or, or formal definition for uh, defining a high-risk PCI, but depends on a lot of factors, clinical characteristics, patient comorbidities, and uh, also anatomical characteristics. 
So if you look at here, our patient had a severe uh, aortic stenosis, unprotected left main, um, and distal left main bifurcation disease. So she would qualify for high-risk PCI. And important considerations uh, when you're considering hemodynamic support for high-risk PCI. The first question to ask is, is the patient hemodynamically stable to begin with? Uh, is, is the blood pressure normal? No. Uh, or if, is the patient in active heart failure? If the answer is uh, the patient is not, not stable, you can consider hemodynamic support. The next question to ask is, is there enough cardiac reserve to sustain a brief ischemic insult during a PCI? That will go with the last remaining vessel PCI or borderline blood pressures when you begin the procedure, severe pulmonary hypertension, low index, and low LVEF of less than 20%. If the answer is yes, yes, you go for a support device. And lastly, is the risk of prolonged ischemic insult risking uh, LV injury high? Uh, that is, if you're considering extensive atherectomy, just like in our patient, <coughs> that is a yes. If, you, if there is a left dominant system uh, with a co complex bifurcation lesion, just like in our patient, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and the retrograde CTO with the dual system compromise. If all these answers are yes, then yes, you consider uh, support device use. The BCIS-1 trial uh, was an uh, uh, open, open multicenter randomized trial back in uh, 2010, published in 2010. It had 301 patients with severe LV dysfunction and extensive CAD. Back in the day, they used a Jeopardy score uh, as their, uh, as their uh, uh, criteria for defining extensive. Nowadays, we use syntax score. Um, elective balloon pump versus uh, before PCI versus no balloon pump, and MACE at hospital discharge was their primary outcome. Uh, as you can see here, there's no significant difference between balloon pump versus no balloon pump in terms of MACE, all-cause mortality. Interestingly, uh, major procedural complications were actually lower in the balloon pump group versus no balloon pump group, and uh, bleeding tend to be a little higher in the balloon pump group. Uh, as you can see, cumulative mortality was no different. And impella in high-risk PCI. This is where a lot of uh, data for impella comes, to, comes for. Uh, it started off with the PROTECT-1 trial ba uh, back in 2009. That was a feasibility trial that included only 20 patients uh, with LVEF less than 35% and a high-risk PCI. They used impella 2.5 back then. There was no CP. And the safety endpoint was a maze at 30 days, which occurred in 20% of the patients. And uh, uh, no, none of the patients uh, had any hemodynamic compromise during the procedure. This was followed by PROTECT-2 trial three years later. That was a prospective multicentral uh, trial that included 448 symptomatic patients with LVEF less than 35% and complex three-vessel disease or left main, unprotected left main disease. Uh, 223 in Impella 2.5 and 225 in Impella and balloon pump and MACE at 30 days was their primary outcome. You can look at here, uh, there was the intention to treat the population was uh, 448 and per protocol population was 427 after uh, changes in, uh, after some of the, uh, after loss of data for a few patients. The intention to treat analysis, uh, Impella was no different compared to balloon pump at 30 days. However, at 90 days, it tended to be a little better, but it was not clinically significant. And most of that seemed to be uh, driven by repeat revascularization rates, uh, which were lower with Impella. The per protocol analysis again, uh, at 30 days there was no difference, but at 90 days there was significant difference favoring Impella 2.5, uh, and again partly driven by repeat revascularization. These are the uh, major uh, Kaplan Meier curves for MACE, at, uh, the intention to treat and per protocol analysis, which was significant in uh, uh, per protocol analysis. And they also looked at uh, what was the maximal decrease in cardiac power output uh, while on device during the procedure. And the Impella patients had a, a less decrease in CPO compared to balloon pump patients. And uh, CPO is, again, we all, as we all know, it's uh, one of the determining factors for uh, out, uh, outcomes in patients with shock. A few important observations about this study in particular are the Impella group had more patients with CHF and uh, history of prior cabbage. And they had more contrast use, um, more use of uh, rotational atherectomy, and much less uh, support time. Not sure if the operators were more comfortable doing uh, more multivessel PCI and more use of more contrast while they had an impella compared to a balloon pump. And the PROTECT-3 post-approval study, this is a single arm uh, FDA uh, post-approval study that included, that's still enrolling actually, back in 2019, 
they submitted an interim analysis on 898 patients. And they compared uh, this data to the PROTECT-2 data. And when they compared the data, they found that in the, the PROTECT-3 study, uh, the patients were much older compared to PROTECT-2. They had more three-vessel PCI and significantly more use of atherectomy, 43.3%, which is pretty staggering compared to 14.2%. And more left main PCI, much longer duration of support, 6.79 hours compared to 1.9, and much less contrast use. And these were the MACE events at 90 days, uh, which were pretty significant in the PROTECT-3 compared to PROTECT-2. Again, PROTECT-3 included both Impella 2.5 and Impella CP. This is the PROTECT-4 uh, study that's currently enrolling patients. They enrolled their first patient back in April this year. Uh, it, it's set to complete, by, I think, uh, from three years or four years from now, and uh, results will be out uh, almost four or five years from now. So they're comparing Impella CP to a balloon pump uh, uh, in 626 patients versus 626. It's a one-to-one -one randomization trial. So this, this uh, study will give us definitive answers. At least we are hoping that it will give us definitive answers uh, comparing which, which device to use, balloon pump or Impella CP, or even we should use a device at all. The tandem heart, I could only find one study from Mayo Clinic back in 2006 that include, included 54 <coughs> patients undergoing high-risk PCI. All of them got tandem heart. Their mean uh, syntax score was pretty high at 33. Uh, I obviously, as expected, they found better improvements in, uh, in the cardiac output during the procedure while on support. And at 30 days and six months, uh, the survival rates were 90% and 87% respectively. And lastly, uh, what if we have an algorithmic approach to support devices? We cannot use, generalize every patient to a uh, support device. We need to pick what, the right patient for the right device, right? So what if we use a, a, that sort of an approach? Step one is to promptly recognize the patient characteristics. Is the patient in shock? patient in cardiac arrest, or the patient undergoing high-risk PCI. Number two, step two, is to have a multidisciplinary heart team approach. As I said, that comprises of critical care, advanced heart failure, intervention cardiology, and CD surgery. And step three is to identify disease severity, how bad is the shock uh, compared, to, uh, uh, compared, uh, compared to other patients, and uh, what, how, how high the, the PCI risk. And it's, it's good to know the flow for each device, how much each device can offer in terms of cardiac output. Balloon pump is pretty modest compared to VIA ECMO, which can go all the way to five to seven liters. Skip this slide here. This is, go over this slide here, okay. So if the patient comes in with cardiac arrest, there is no uh, uh, return of spontaneous circulation. Talk to the, uh, consult the whole uh, multidisciplinary heart team. And if that's the case, uh, everybody agrees, go for a VA ECMO. If there is ROSC, or if the patient comes with cardiogenic shock, the next thing to look at is, how bad is the shock? Is it early shock, or shock, or even severe shock? That depends on multiple factors, systemic blood pressure, uh, right heart cath numbers, and a, a clinical exam. If it is a pre-shock, you can start off with a balloon pump, proceed with revascularization, reassess the hemodynamics after PCI, and then escalate therapy if needed. If it is severe shock, the first question to ask is if the patient is in hypoxemia, yes or no. If the answer is yes, then you can go for a VA ECMO directly because uh, with ECMO, you can oxygenate the blood. If the answer is no, the next question to ask is if there is a bi failure or uh, just a LV failure. If there is a bi failure, then you can consider using Impella RP and Impella CP or even a tandem heart. I've not discussed much about Impella RP in the talk here because uh, the evidence for Impella RP in the setting of uh, MI and shock is pretty pretty limited. I know there are other trials uh, going on for Impella RP for shock overall, but uh, MI patients and shock very very limited data. If the answer is no, go for uh, then look at RV failure. You can look at the PAPI numbers on the SWAN, the CPO, and uh, uh, RA pressures. If the answer is yes for RV pa failure, then you can consider Impella RP or just a tandem heart alone. And if the answer is no, which, is, uh, which brings us to the last, uh, the last thing is LV failure, then do an ephemeral angiogram and consider for Impella CP or a tandem heart. Coming to the high-risk PCI, as uh, mentioned before, identify all the features of uh, high-risk PCI uh, and then uh, do a femoral angiogram, uh, look at how, how good the femoral arteries are. If the answer is uh, no, yes, then go ahead with the Impella 2.5 or CP. 
So the answer is no in patients with severe peripheral vascular disease. You can consider alternative access like axillary or trench cable access. Uh, if if uh, the operator is proficient in doing these access, yes, consider impeller. If no, then the obvious choice will be go for a balloon pump and hope uh, uh, it will be a good result in the end. And finally, uh, contraindications and complications. And no, no procedure in medicine is risk-free, and we all know that. Um, con the two most common com uh, contraindications for all the devices are uh, moderate to severe AR and uh, severe peripheral vascular disease. And after, apart from that, uh, each device has its own specific contraindication for impella. If there is an LV thrombus, you cannot use it. And the mechanical aortic valve, you cannot use it. And they say in aortic stenosis, you can use it even for severe. But if it is critical aortic stenosis, valve area less than 0 0.6 centimeters square, you cannot uh, place an impella device. And tandem heart, uh, severe peripheral vascular disease, and contraindication to anticoagulation, and LA thrombus as well. And vascular complications are significantly higher with uh, uh, VA ECMO because of the size of the cannulas we use for placement. In conclusion, use of mechanical circuitry to support devices should be individualized depending on patient characteristics, as I, I mentioned before. Look at their oral presentation, patient comorbidities, um, and then decide uh, which device to use. We cannot generalize uh, all patients to all devices. Multidisciplinary heart team approach is, uh, is probably the preferred way to go uh, to have a successful program. And uh, again, more research is uh, still needed due to paucity of high quality evidence. Questions? I have a question, thank you. Um, that was a very um, important topic, and so I appreciate you taking the time to review this. But it seems obvious to all of us that the circulatory su support devices are not going to be the magic bullet to this problem. Right. And so I wonder what your thoughts are, and then I'd maybe ask Jay to chime in as to why these people don't respond to revascularization in, in the same way uh, that others do. And are, is there anything new in the way of thinking about how to, to, to look at, you know, at other, other physiology that might open the door to improvement? I guess, uh, as of now, my understanding is we don't know uh, too much about cardiogenic shock and what happens really, the physiology, uh, the whole body physiology, because when the patient is in shock, it's not just the heart that's affected, because you're affecting perfusion to the whole body. It, that affects the kidneys as well, and the gut, and a lot of other, other organs. I think part of the bad outcomes could be related to uh, other uh, organs being at, uh, at the fault, uh, at a uh, bad end as well. And, uh, thing is, how quickly you initiate uh, support devices in these patients probably plays a significant role. If, you, if you're doing, say, a patient comes in with shock and uh, they tend to have an MI, uh, and do you give them a support first to stabilize the whole system and then do a PCI versus doing a PCI and then putting an impella or, or any support device? So as of now, we don't have a clear evidence. Again, there are some observation studies that, says, that say that uh, putting a device before works better than putting a device after, but we don't have any randomized evidence yet. Again, as I said, we don't know uh, everything about the cardiogenic shock physiology as of now. Well, I know of some data uh, that I'm aware of in, in, in your uh, high-risk PCI group with chronic, you know, hibernating myocardium. I know Ed McFalls did some really interesting work in, uh, they have a, a swine model of chronically hypoperfused myocardium, and then they revascularize those animals, and, and the revascularization really didn't improve the energetics or the, uh, the, the function of the, right. of the ventricle, so, um, which is kind of goes against everything we, we think about as yeah. far as revascularization, like in, in three-vessel uh, disease, but, um, but uh, I think chronic hypoperfusion is clearly a bad, you know, a, a bad thing to uh, subject your, uh, your heart, heart to. Um, and, uh, but I, I think there's still just a big black box out there as far as what's going, what's going on, uh, with, with these, um, with these devices as far as, uh, you know, in the setting of, um, of, uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, in, in, sh in shock, um, so, and, and that's the problem that the, you know, as far as doing randomized controlled trials. So first of all, 
you know, there's, there's the whole issue with consent and everything like that. And then there's the whole issue of cost. Right. Uh, you didn't really, it'd be interesting to see if you, you, if you know, like, what the cost and reimbursement is for these devices. They're quite, uh, you know, expensive. So it's really hard to, it's a, I mean, I, I, you know, we talked about years ago about the regulatory burden in these kind of trials because, uh, of, you know, of getting uh, of consent, um, you know, in the cardiac arrest patients, the cardiogenic shock patients. Um, so that's a, a big problem as well. And I think that's led to just, there's, the data is really quite poor. Right. Um, I mean, this whole thing about using historic, historical, historical controls, controls is nonsense, yeah. I think. Uh, I mean, if you look at the, you know, we've really made a lot of advances like in pharmacotherapy and in the shock teams and things like that. And, you know, we're really improving mortality and, and outcomes, I think. And then, you know, to, to rest, have your data rest on a group five or ten years earlier and say, oh, yeah, this really works. I don't, I don't know. I don't trust that, that data. Right. What is your take on the, uh, the door to unload time for STEMI without shock? Um, I know, I know. <laughs> right. So uh, I don't know. They, I, they compared uh, unloading followed by immediate revascularization versus waiting for 30 minutes. I don't, I don't know if uh, comparing unloading followed by uh, or no unloading works differently. I mean, what, what about the whole time is muscle? Right, exactly. Uh, We're going backwards now. Here is, uh, you're delaying it for 30 minutes to, to do that. I don't know. I mean, there's so mu much we don't know about ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, I mean that's sort of the holy one of the holy grails left, you know that and like microvascular obstruction in these STEMI patients. Uh, um, you know what what really works and what are the what are the you know the mechanisms. Um, so I think we really you know it's a whole. You know I just think it's incumbent on us to get better data. I think that there's a couple of points on this. One is that we don't understand metabolically what's going right. on in cardiogenic shock, and there's. You know, if, like you said, with microvascular obstruction and, and all that other uh, type of stuff, there's probably going to be something come out at some point pharmacologically that, you know, because you need to affect the entire body, as, right. as you, you said. Right. The other thing that I've watched and thought was very interesting is the way that um, industry has driven this. <laughs> and um, I think it's very important that we remain, you know, maintain our skepticism uh, in in the face of a whole lot of investment bankers telling us that we should be using some certain product or another. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like Tavern, I think. <laughs> So this is this was a great talk, and I think it just shows the trend as well that the role of surgery. I know you said heart team, but I think our role is limited as better options can be done to support the heart initially. I would say surgery probably uh, has a role only if there is a mechanical issue like you know rupture papillary muscle or VAP. In fact, in Colombia, they have been trying this as well for especially post infarct VAPs to support the patient for like more for a few days and then operate them rather than rushing into it uh, straight away, uh, which is initially what we did and we still do and then like 50% more time. So I think the role definitely with Impella, at least the perception I have is this will give us that window in some of those critically you know, high risk patients where we have really high mortality. It's very, very difficult to show the benefit in a trial uh, in these patients. And so this is somewhere I think Impella will play a very important role. My question to you as a surgeon who has probably Jay answered it is how much time it takes uh, from vascular access point to confirm the femorance are good, the vasculature is not excessively tortured, and then place either in Impella compared to IABP. Is there a once we get a, a femoral axis, uh, getting a femoral angiogram takes just a few seconds after we get a femoral axis. But placing a balloon pump is obviously the most easiest of all. You, get a, you put a 9 French and a, you place it in the descending iota. But impella probably takes a lot of time to set up the whole process the, because the ref has to be there or somebody who knows the impella setup has to be there 
and then they have to guide us uh, while we while we place the impeller because the setup itself takes more than at least five ten minutes uh, for impeller. So from incubation that you need to the impeller goes in, you say what half an hour or more? Or oh no, or more? It, probably more. Yeah. I, I no, I th I think uh, you know in experienced centers that do a lot of impeller, yeah. they'll tell you they can do it extremely yeah. quickly. We don't do as much impeller as you know, Henry Ford and, and that type of stuff. So if, if you were using that as a criteria, that's, that's probably not a good one because it, it really is a, a matter of, you know, your own site's expertise and comfort with it. Are you, can your tech set that up? You know, can one tech be yeah. setting it up yeah. while you're getting access? The reason I was asking is it explains why you revascularize first and then insert it. I, I would have thought that could be one of the reasons why the bias is there. Right. Well, I just thought the door to unload, you know, and then the waiting the 30 minutes, that was just a trial of, can you use Impella this way or should you use it that way? I thought that, that was just a complete. Yeah, they, they concluded saying yeah. that it's feasible and safe to actually wait and uh, do uh, do 30, 30 minute wait and do revascularization. Yeah. That, that was their conclusion. <laughs> and on the other side, there's no difference. Really versus immediate revascularization either. They didn't talk about that. They talked about waiting time. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Sharkey. Questions from... Uh... Yeah, there's just a couple um, online questions. They're both from Dr. Chavez, who asks, uh, the first of which is, VA ECMO provides excellent hemodynamic support. Uh, in acute STEMI and cardiogenic shock, VA ECMO worsens LV overload at the worst possible time. Uh, and may worsen outcomes. So the question is, what evidence is there for the use of ECPELLA, which is E-C-P-E-L-L-A, in these patients? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, the question is... <laughs> Our series of three patients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, there is very limited data uh, to use ECPELLA. The whole point of using an impella in, in the setting of an ECMO is to vent the LV. And uh, uh, we, when we place an impeller to vent the LV, we don't usually usually use high settings for impeller, for impeller like P8 or P9. We barely use like P3 or P4 settings. That's just to unload the uh, load the unload the LV. And some uh, there are some studies that used balloon pump instead of uh, impeller in uh, in addition to ECMO. But there are not many studies out there. Just a few case series here and there, uh, but not not that I at least came across in my uh, review. There's just one more from Dr. Chavez as well, uh, who asks, and I'm not sure if you uh, covered this in your answer, but should you uh, or should Impella be placed in all patients in acute MI with refractory shock or only in those who develop poor uh, pulsatility, as in your case? <laughs> Again, a difficult question. As of now, I don't think uh, we have enough evidence to say we can use uh, Impella uh, for cardiogenic shock. But again, uh, following that algorithm probably may give us some answers. If you, if you see a patient in severe shock, um, I can show this here, severe shock and uh, you, you identify with a bi, bi failure or a L, single LV failure, it's, it's not unreasonable to do it, but again, we need more evidence to support that, evidence, uh, support that practice. Excellent. I'm slightly confused about the ECMO and afterload here. So you, you, on ECMO, I assume you get Amongst all the circulatory supports, you get the best LV emptying. Is that correct or not? So it's uh, it's not about uh, LV emptying, but uh, so it, the ECMO puts blood back into the aorta. So if the flow is high, if the, you set up the flow really high on ECMO, you can actually increase afterload because the blood is flowing against the uh, the normal pumping direction of the heart. So you can actually increase afterload. That's where. Uh, uh, some people say uh, bad outcomes happen with ECMO because there's not enough, uh, you're not letting the, uh, I mean, I would say you're increasing the LV wall stress by incre increasing that much afterload on the LV. The LV is empty. So it's, it's emptying, but... Uh, five or seven liter flow, uh, LV is emptying. It means whatever is going through is barely some pulmonary perfusion. Mm -hmm. So that's what cardiopulmonary bypass does, right? Right. You go through ECMO is essentially that. So you go and we is empty. So by increasing the diastolic pressure, maybe you're increasing the coronary flow there. So that's why I mean, I'm just curious about this. That what's the logic of using impeller and ECMO together? There's still going to be a, a subset of the people that 
who aren't getting any kind of LV emptying at all, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, he showed you that patient whose aortic valve wasn't opening at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they, those people often have high wedges despite, despite uh, the use of uh, a ECMO. Where you're, you can provide a kind of heart reduction. So. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Very good job. Very good. Thank you.